Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, more specifically, this is Global Connections with Carlos Juarez. Joins us from Texas, I think, today. And uh, <laughs> Carlos, welcome to the show. Aloha, Jay. Always a pleasure to connect and obviously give you some additional perspective there uh, as we call this Globe Global Connections. Uh, I always have one leg and one arm in Mexico and another part in Texas. So I kind of straddle the border. And unlike um, some people, I build bridges. I, I basically connect uh, these two parts of, of, of North America. Uh, and uh, well, uh, of, you know, of, uh, great opportunity for us to continue our dialogue as we've had. Uh, That's why know, we the... appreciate you so much, Carlos. By the way, uh, the, the name of the show is um, America is Burning, and it is. Um, and how does that, I suppose, the unspoken part is how does that look to the rest of the world? How does it compare to the rest of the world? That's right. um, and by the way, I, I just saw in the news that the governor of Texas has, 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 has required masks now. That's if you're right. outside as of today. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So again, in, in Texas, like Florida, like California, and a few other spots, uh, you know, right now uh, facing uh, rather uh, well uh, unexpected peaks, and and you know, it happened a few weeks back. We we had this, or a month or two ago, we began this opening process, and now we're seeing. Uh, what has happened, especially in, in places like bars and places where people are gathering in you know, close surroundings. Not, uh, but beyond that, uh, we'll, we'll unravel some of this. I mean, a lot of it is, I, I think it continues to be the mixed signals we get from the, the, the national leadership. Uh, President Trump has not yet you know, come out and said, hey, I think, what, a, year, a day or two, he said something that sounded more positive towards masks. But you know, um, at the end of the day, uh, we have a handful of Republicans, still too few, too small, and very late. Uh, so, you know, if you don't have, uh, I think, proper leadership, uh, leading by example and, and making clear, um, you know, you're going to have uh, a lot of people, uh, well, and, and part of it, too, is this independent culture of the U.S. Uh, it's remarkable when you compare with other nations. I mean, look at in many of the East Asian countries, uh, whether it's Taiwan or even, you know, South Korea. Um, these are places that, well, you know, there are different factors, but the people... Basically, you know, I guess, you know, they see it as part of their own civic duty. Uh, and I think what strikes me is that so many people have this sense of very selfishness, not realizing that those actions are affecting you and me and my father and, you know, my, uh, you know, friends. Uh, this is a public good. And, 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 and the, the pandemic doesn't like just it doesn't stop at borders and it doesn't just somehow affect only certain people. It, it's it's everywhere, uh, and it's well. There. Let me let me let me uh, sort of ask you if this um, if this works for the model of spreader that we hear about. The model of spreader we hear about <clears throat> wants to go to Fort Lauderdale for um, the spring festivities. He wants to go to the beach, or she, she, he or she wants to um, you know socially engage, and he's in his late uh, teens or early twenties. Um, is he thinking about community versus individualism, or is he not. just badly educated? Well, it's a, a little bit of everything, and, and obviously a, a little bit of selfishness, too, and not understanding. Again, uh, uh, because we hear it again and again from the experts, and, and unfortunately, when we don't heed their warnings, we, we have this. So uh, I, I go back to this. I mean, the proper role of a political leader is to set the tone, lead by example, repeat, you know, share information, let the experts, let the science guide, uh, you know, our, our, you know, our, our policies. Um, and, uh, you know, from the get-go, we've seen, again, uh, way back in, you know, the beginning of the year, in the early part of this uh, crisis, uh, President Trump kind of dismissing it. And then, you know, after what, maybe two months of daily meetings, suddenly it just all stopped. And now there's no information. And, and, and I think that becomes a problem, too. You, you just don't have it. Uh, because I've been watching and monitoring, you know, both uh, what's happening in Mexico very carefully and other parts of the world. You really need to have the leadership telling you and reminding you and reminding you again and again uh, and giving you and yet at the same time giving you hope saying, look, if we do this, this will happen. Here's what we have to do. And here's why it, it, it's got to be a, a full package. Uh, in the absence of that, we're going to just have this very hodgepodge. And, and I think in the end, without a clear strategy or policy from the U.S., what you have is individual states and communities and cities kind of having to take it up on their own. And that's not the most effective uh, way uh, at all. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, we've been talking about that. I mean, if, if he was speaking to the nation, then that would um, uh, avoid the, the differentiation between states and cities and counties. But, mm -hmm. but what he has done is not only has he not spoken to the nation, he has said, it's not my problem. 
It's yeah. their problem. They got to fix it. They got to find a way. And then he doesn't help them. As a matter of fact, he stands in the way, for example, of setting up com competitive markets, competitive bidding on uh, ventilators, which is mm. very destructive stuff, and masks, uh, and then lying on top of all of that. So what you get is a thousand voices, a thousand policies. They don't agree with each other. They take different positions at different times, and you have no, no collaboration at all. Yeah. If you want to deal with a pandemic, you have to collaborate. Yeah, and, and it's the mixed signals that just send more confusion. And, you know, it's interesting because, of course, we're facing now in barely four months now this presidential election, of course. And at least today, today in early July, we've got, you know, polls telling us that obviously Biden is doing better and, and, and Trump is not doing so well, except, except uh, when, when asked uh, how... Uh, one of these candidates handles the economy, there's still a significant amount of support for Trump in handling the economy. But the irony is that that's a double-edged sword because it then gives him uh, a reason to somehow, uh, you know, not look at the pandemic, not look at these other issues and try to focus on, you know, starting up the economy. And unfortunately, what we've begun to see already now very clearly this past month is uh, moving too soon to open and not doing it, you know, somehow carefully it's going to backfire. And so now we have states like Texas and Florida that are suddenly having to put the brakes and, and cancel, you know, uh, the opening uh, or reverse, I guess, you know, uh, opening beaches and whatnot or, or any of the. Oh, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, one of his big platform points is look at all that I've done for the economy. And, uh, you know, it was I wouldn't call it great beforehand. I, I, I think it was sort of flimsy uh, running to the end of 2019. Um, there's such disparity in wealth, such disparity in, um, in control and all that. And he was, he was feeding money to the wealthy, you know, with the tax reform act. But <clears throat> I think what strikes me most is he gets up, up on the stage and he says, we're back, we've licked it. Now we have to reopen. <clears throat> and and he, was, he was a leader in that. Um, and he created a, a followership who all agreed, let's reopen, we gotta reopen, we have to get back our old economy and all that, all the Trump economy. He was thinking that it was a, you know, a, a great political move for the election. But in fact, I don't know how you felt. When I saw him say that, I said, wait a minute, have we fixed the problem yet? Have we, have we provided masks, ventilators, policy? Have we, have we been um, helpful on social distancing? Uh, have we been helpful on, um, um, on therapeutics and vaccines? No, we hadn't done anything. And he stands up there and says, you got to rebuild my economy. I said, this is going to be a disaster. How did you feel? Well, I mean, some of that too. And, and I think the other thing that we have to understand, the U.S. is a very large country, uh, you know, and, and what's happening in Wyoming is not the same as Virginia, Florida, even Hawaii relative to other places has been much more modest and, and, you know, but again, you're in an island economy, it's much more easy to you know, seal it off. Uh, what I'm getting at there is that you can't expect the same outcome in every place. And some places are going to simply have, so you need a little bit of wiggle room and flexibility. But I think at the end, you really need to have a continual message that is consistent and clear. And, uh, and so while you reopen, you have to do it smart. You can't just do it and everything. We're going back to normal. And that's why you need good communication that explains it. We're going to do it, but we have to do it carefully. We still have to social distance. We have to, and we have to be driven by the data. Uh, we have to see, okay, as we now see, things have gone bad. And you mentioned the governor of Texas. Well, he's looking at the numbers and by any objective measure, you're seeing a massive spike. And, and, and that's a result of poor, uh, again, poor, you know, decisions and, and, and people just kind of going loose and thinking it's all over. Uh, even after what, in the past week I saw here, uh, they've uh, begun closing the bars and you've got a group of bar owners that are suing the state because you know somehow they're being discriminated. And to me, that's just astonishing. Uh, I go back to this in the end, I think people have to understand this is a, first of all, it's a health crisis. Uh, yes, the economy, yes, so we need that and it's going to come back. But frankly, if we don't address the health crisis, the economy is gonna continue to lag and, and it's going to be longer we're going to have more you know lockdowns in the future so it's a health crisis first uh and more than that it's also a public issue a public good or you know somehow something that we all have to come together to understand and that my actions affect you your actions affect me but well, we're not doing that the people are not together and, and uh as usual uh, trump has been divisive 
He's made divisive statements. This thing about the mask is it's divisive. And he has people fighting with each other about whether they should wear a mask when they come into the store, actually fighting. And there was one case where somebody shot somebody who tried to get him to wear a mask coming into a store. But let's talk about Europe for a moment. Mm -hmm. I saw a thing in the, in the paper a couple of days ago about total population of the EU is 446 million. Okay? That's a uh, uh, half again as big as the U.S., uh, or at least substantially, the U.S. is 330. Um, and, they, and they have, uh, these days, they have 35, 3,500 new cases, new COVID cases a day, 3,500, okay? The state of, the state of uh, Arizona has a population of 7.2 million, which is a small fraction of the EU. And they have a, a new cases of 4,800, per day. That's more than all of the EU. Um, we are so far out of control. Fauci says we are so far out of control. And really, the question is, can we ever come back? Can we ever get control? Well, again, we are at a very clear, vast difference there. Uh, and today, what we see, again, I don't have the beautiful charts, but you can just see Europe, you know, did this, and, and, and now it has bent that curve down, and it's down here. You know, we've done this, and now we just seem to be going again, uh, spiking up. Uh, so it's a very uneven situation. Um, and again, I would just say in Europe, while there is some variation there, no doubt, and actually the UK, pretty problematic still. Um, nevertheless, on the whole, the EU has managed to more effectively coordinate and cooperate. And look at, look at you can imagine the sting it must have been for Trump. Uh, the EU has just announced they are going to restrict travel from the United States together with Russia and Brazil. And so we're suddenly not going to be able to get to Europe uh, with a very few minor exceptions. Uh, that's got a sting, uh, you know, be, and, and, and my first thought when that was announced, I, well, I'm sure he's going to be angry enough to like impose more tariffs or more, you know, some kind of a uh, you know, reaction that will be uh, more rash and impulsive. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, again, I, I think we're seeing the unevenness. And the other bigger question, of course, is the, yes, it, it is, I've mentioned a health crisis, no doubt. But the impact on the economy, I mean, the global economy on the whole is, you know, never experienced this in, in our lifetime. Uh, the U.S. economy, of course, is going to be plunging even lower. Uh, I was reading uh, or no, hearing, uh, looking at some recent reports from the International Monetary Fund where they have now just back in April, they had projected a decline of 3% for the global economy. Now it's going up to 49 uh, the U.S. even more, more closer to 6%. But these numbers are kind of hard to really know because everything is in flux, you know, a lot of uncertainty. Bottom line is we're going to be facing a very slow recovery. Uh, and, you know, will we confront, uh, you know, a second wave? Because actually what we're seeing in the U.S. is not a second wave. We're still in that first one that hasn't quite been effectively managed. Uh, but as we're being told by many, uh, we might anticipate in the fall or in the winter, uh, you know, a return of a different, you know, even in places like Europe, they have to be monitoring it carefully. Uh, but at the end of the day, the other point, and, and I want to maybe address this quickly, is that the pandemic is now no longer centered primarily in Europe. It is in the U.S., absolutely, but it's also now spreading in the developing world, and in particular, Latin America. Mm. Uh, and, and we see Brazil has been, of course, in the headlines for some time, and they are facing deep crisis. Mexico, is, as well now, is, is at the peak at the moment. And one of the challenges we have about all these places is that often the information is really hard to nail down and get accurate. Uh, they're not doing as much testing, so they don't actually have real numbers and, and information. Uh, but there are differences in these emerging markets, developing countries, that are gonna play out in different ways uh, in the wealthier advanced industrial economies of Europe and the US. Obviously you have a safety net that's greater. You have a central bank that can sort of stimulate the economy in different ways. Uh, you have many people, a pretty good percentage who have the capacity like you and I here, we continue our work, it goes on, we have to modify it. But when you look at a place like Brazil or Mexico or Peru, a very high percentage of the population is in the informal economy. They don't have regular jobs. They depend on day-to-day, -day, you know, selling goods on the street or, or doing more you know, informal bartering. And there is simply no, no safety net there. Uh, set aside, uh, you also have healthcare systems that are going to be weaker and, 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 and you know, strained. Uh, you've also got a lower per capita income. And so, again, there, people are going to be harder hit. Uh, and again, limited role for the government. Uh, there's also no social distancing. When you have massive, you know, uh, 
crowded uh, urbanized centers, which is the reality for most of Latin America, people don't have the luxury of staying at home in a nice home where they can just, you know, cubby away. They have to go out into the street, into the public transport. And, uh, and so without social distancing, without the economic wherewithal, without even the testing to really give us accurate information, uh, the numbers simply, they may look better than the reality. And so uh, I think, yeah. you know, we spoke a couple months ago, we spoke about this, how it's going to play out in the developing world. But interestingly, I would tell you, the case of Africa is rather curious because in many ways, uh, uh, it's a very young population in many of the countries, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but we're not likely to see as grave of a situation. And it's not entirely clear why. Some of it is a function of, you know, maybe less mobility of societies. You know, even Latin America today, they're very globalized and, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot more interaction with the other parts of the world. Um, but um, Sub-Saharan Africa, curiously, may come out better uh, than, uh, than places like Latin America or, or certainly Europe did. Uh, younger populations that, that obviously can also expect to do better. Yeah, yeah that, is, that is curious. And I, I have the same sense of it, although I have no data. <laughs> but, you know, I want to talk about what happens when you take that analysis further. So India, for example, very highly populated. A lot of people working on that, um, you know, that informal economy you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, the government really doesn't do much for them. Um, and uh, they, they get hungry. Um, and there, there are food, food banks uh, available, but you have, to, you have to go miles or, you know, a, a walk or take a train even to get food. Um, so the government is really not dropping it on their doorstop, at, at doorstep. And, and, you know, what is happening is that it, it's unraveling country. This is my information, I mean, they're unraveling. Yeah. And I think this is a phenomenon you're gonna see in, in a variety of these developing countries where it really unravels. Uh, they, they have nothing to lose by going out on the street. Um, they have nothing to lose by, by seizing on those on the other side of the tracks and saying, we, we have to march on them. Uh, they have goods, they have what we want, and we're going to go and take it. Yeah. Um, and I, I really worry about an unraveling of the social order mm -hmm. in countries like that, because they, mm -hmm. will, they will be starving otherwise, and uh, what else they got to do? Yeah. Uh, furthermore, I would say that to maybe to a limited degree or a lesser degree, uh, we're going to see that sort of thing in the U.S. People now don't have jobs, they don't have a prospect of jobs, their unemployment insurance is running out, their health insurance is, you know, at, in question. Um, they don't have resources. They haven't been saving. Uh, this country has terrible numbers on saving. Uh, so they're going to be on the street too, and they're going to be hungry. What will happen to the social order? So here, there, and everywhere. Yeah. And, and look at the U.S. I mean, aside from the pandemic, aside from the economic, you know, punch, suddenly we have this, you know, racial uh, injustice protest kind of weaved into there. And then add to that an election that somehow in the midst of that, there's pressure and the president's wanting to do rallies. And he's going to have, uh, I think, for the July 4th over in Mount Rushmore. And they've made oh. clear uh, no so, you know, no masks. <laughs> so we, we, we got compounded onto what is essentially this pandemic, uh, other factors. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the potential is there. Uh, typically, we would talk about like the developing world, the sort of third world uh, as places of social conflict and tension. But we see it right here in our you know, US of A, uh, a lot of divide and even something like the mask, how, how we've seen so much uh, discussion about how that's become like a political statement. Uh, and you have many, particularly males, who are sort of pushing a very... Uh, you know, it's almost a hyper-nationalist agenda that, you know, wearing a mask is kind of a wimpiness or weakness. And if the president is not, you know, obviously, you know, modeling that, uh, they're going to be uh, following his lead. So I, I see also the tensions here in the U.S., again, the, with the, the protest movement this past month. Uh, you know, in other parts of the world, uh, again, we're going to see that as well. And then, and, 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 um, but I go back to this. One of the challenges, I think, uh, is getting good information in a lot of places, and uh, particularly, again, Mexico, my case in point that I, that I know quite well. I struggle myself as, a, you know, as an academic expert to really know what is the true information. Now, there are places you can see it. The news does provide some of it, but the government is often criticized at kind of trying to put a spin on it or, or maybe not being as, as, as blunt or as open as it could be. Uh, and President uh, López Obrador in Mexico, a populist leader, a leftist leader, uh, took a lot of criticism also for downplaying it and, and sort of, you know, uh, wishful thinking. Now, Brazil, the other big power in South America, uh, with a different 
variation of populism, a right-wing leader who also, perhaps in a more extreme way, has sort of been in denial, has taken a lot of heat for that. Uh, again, I just can't go back to that. The power of leadership, the importance of political leadership. If you don't have it, if it's not a consistent message with good you know, data and, and a mixture of the seriousness, but also providing some hope. Hey, if we do this, if we stick it together, if we you know, cooperate, it will get better. You need to have that. So it's not just gloom and doom, but it's also seriousness. Here's what we need to do. And here's why we do it. And at the end of the light, you know, at the end of the tunnel, it will be better. Yeah, Otherwise, determination and perseverance. Mm -hmm. The guy in Brazil, like Trump, is a denier. Yes. And uh, he's sending, you know, really negative messages to people about taking care of themselves and their mm -hmm. and their fellow men and women. Yeah. And, yeah. and the problem there is, look what happened. Look what happened in Brazil. It's got an enormous spike going on. Yeah. Uh, and these things are, you know, the one thing that Fauci said that that. That, that sticks with me is that when you lose control, this is a big price to pay because sure. it's very hard to regain control. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and it sort of, it unravels. It kind of becomes like a, one of these, uh, uh, I don't know, it takes on a life of its own and you can't just yeah. put the brakes on it. Uh, yeah. And then uh, the, pra the fact is, you know, the political leadership, if you've had a leader, whether it's Trump or Bolsonaro in Brazil, who has been in denial, and, and then suddenly they decide to say, change their tune, they don't have credibility. People are not going to accept it as real, legitimate. So uh, you 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 know you just can't you can't change it on a dime, uh, and that that's a real problem. Yeah, well that that certainly that exists here. Uh, Trump has been lying, you know, for his entire administration, and he continues to do that and misleading us. If all of a sudden he was to get straight, if all of a sudden he was to tell the truth, nobody would believe him anyway. He has zero credibility with you know at least 50, 60 percent of the country and, and the other was the other ones following blindly which uh, without critical thinking so um you know i feel that the um the phenomenon you describe in in the, in the developing countries in terms of leadership and credibility is the same here yeah 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 absolutely and and you know gosh i i think uh it, it's frustrating and then with the u.s uh, political system we've got the Republican, particularly in the Senate, uh, the, the Republicans who are simply kind of you know looking the other way and 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 you know uh, looking to cover their own asses, let's say, um, and uh, we've had a very small number, uh, even you know in the House. Uh, I think Liz Cheney, this uh, one of the House leaders, uh, has begun to push back, and increasingly, what we're starting to see now for the presidential campaign is a small number, but a, a perhaps growing number of. Republicans who are now anti-Trump Republicans. And until you see enough of those to kind of make a, a critical, uh, uh, will we see it? And again, uh, in terms of the political analysis, yes, if the election was held today, maybe we could anticipate an outcome. But guess what? The president has tremendous powers of incumbency and uh, a track record of using dirty tricks. And uh, who, you know, who's to say that come September, October, there might be some you know, disinformation that comes out and, uh, you know, the, remember the Ukraine saga, we might see some, you know, you know, whether it's even true information or not, it's just, you know, throwing mud on the wall. Um, and I can think we can anticipate it's going to get pretty ugly and pretty nasty. Um, yeah. Right? And a lot of people will be misled. You can, you can assume that he'll try to, you know, he'll try to bury Biden uh, with some kind of uh, phony distraction. Sure. It's very serious. But going back to Congress for a minute, mm -hmm. Congress is dysfunctional. So what I was uh, alluding to before is this whole thing about the social fabric breaking down yeah. economically, socially. It's not just Black Lives Matter. It's people in the street looking for food. Um, and I, you know, I think we have the risk of that happening because the benefits that have been out there are, are, are uh, you know, they're ending. Um, and there may not be so much benefit anymore by That's the states right. or the federal government. Sure. And they got to eat. So what do you do? Well, the, the government has to act. It has to provide food yeah. and uh, jobs even. You know, somebody referred earlier today in a show to the, 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 the CCC, the Conservation Corps, mm -hmm. uh, during FDR and the WPA during FDR. Um, the government hasn't even touched that one. Um, so we, you know, I'm not sure the government can prevent people from going out in the streets because it's, it's, it's dysfunctional. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I, some time ago, a, a month or two ago, I heard a fascinating uh, interview about a, a, somebody from the sort of restaurant uh, business because they've been hit hardest, of course. They've been closed for months. Some of them will not survive. But what he was describing was a fascinating, like, why didn't we figure this out? And he was saying how 
rather than give everybody these stimulus checks and just you know put money in the economy, which is obviously the easy strategy, why not turn to the restaurants and say turn them into almost like a community, you know? And now this has happened at the micro level in many places. Some some restaurateurs say, hey, what do I do? I know how to make food, and so let me begin this. But it would have been probably almost better to sort of have the government so okay, work with the restaurants, say, look, we will provide you with this, you know, stimulus. You you've got the facilities, the capacity. You're in the neighborhood, and then those people, instead of going to these food banks, which has also been you know dramatic to see the the massive outpouring, uh, but it would also keep alive these restaurants in a way to do what they know how to do best. Uh, instead, we've got restaurants that are clearly not going not going to survive a, a fair number well, of them. Well, they're already folding up. Absolutely. They and, they're folding up in Hawaii. They're not coming back. Sure. And as you suggested a minute ago, uh, the stimulus that we've seen and maybe the ability of the national government, the federal government, to, to provide that, at some point it's going to be running out. It can't just simply, you know, even the unemployment benefits, there's a, there's a limited capacity. Uh, but it goes back to this. Do we manage the health crisis so that we can get to the economic crisis? Or do we rush to get the economy running without having the health crisis solved. And that's where we are now. We're seeing- What's, what's your answer to that, Carlos? Well, again, uh, we're already seeing now the need to reverse uh, a lot of this opening. Uh, I, again, I just go back to this, you know, you've got some leaders, again, even this president, this governor of Texas suddenly having to eat some grow and have to decide, hey, guess what? You know, maybe we did move a little too quickly. By contrast, uh, Texas has a controversial uh, lieutenant governor, very, very uh, uh, outspoken. And he, uh, a few days ago in Fox News, was very critical of Fauci saying that he's going to stop listening to him. The Fauci doesn't know anything. And it's like, again, those kind of signals from political leaders, they don't help. They make it worse because, because some people, especially maybe those that aren't terribly informed, that's all they hear. And when they hear that, then they're not going to wear masks. They're not going to care. They're going to blame, you know, the, whatever, you know, the left wing uh, you know, media uh, when what we really need is good information and, and effective leadership. Uh, and it's not a partisan issue. Any leader needs to be doing this. Uh, uh, so boy, um, you know, we've just, we've brought out like the worst in everything. Uh, and uh, we're paying for that now by, by the aggressive push to perhaps essentially open too quickly and without careful management of all the pieces of the puzzle. So it, it's, it's- you know, the, problem, the problem is we open too quickly. Um, it's, hard, <clears throat> it's hard to go back to lockdown. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people yeah, resist yeah. that oh, they don't yeah. want to do that of course and so they get confused they get angry they, and remember they're they're stuck it's not like they can get out of this they're no. they're locked into it even if they're not in lockdown so i really worry about the 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 average uh, person mm-hmm. um feeling very badly and um looking for a, a way out if you will yeah. looking for some relief from the pressure uh you know because we all live our lives we all know that we have a certain amount of time on the planet. And right now, this is lost time. This is like Rip Van Winkle. Yeah. You know, maybe you wake up later and find it's, find it's better. Mm-hmm. But right now, I, I can't be optimistic. Yeah. So what do you think is going to happen here? You give me a two-week uh, expectation, Carlos. <laughs> Gosh, I mean, uh, again, I, I think right now we're still seeing this peak, and it's not going to go away right away in some of these places, uh, whether it's Texas or you know, Florida. <coughs> that, that will continue. Um, I'm curious to see, you know, because uh, we've got pushback already from, you know, the, the reversal now to have to close back down. Uh, that's not going to be well received by many people. Uh, and uh, and yet, you know, it, I go back to this, you know, we need good information and we need people to to, to accept it and understand it. And, and I think, uh, you know, we've had this polarization of our body politic now for years. It's not something that arrived now. Uh, but given... Uh, given that that was already there, this has only exacerbated it. So now you have even more divide. Uh, I don't have a lot of optimism for the near term. Uh, you know, there are others who will say, wow, this is a great opportunity once we come out of it and we'll redefine, you know, the workplace and the home place. And uh, for some, that will work. Clearly, there's a further divide. Those of us who have, who work more in the knowledge and service sector, who, who can somehow continue what we're doing versus those who are maybe, you know, working more with manual, you know, manufacturing or the, you know, the, the, the hotel and, 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 and restaurant businesses, they are not going to be able to come back to where they were. They have to reinvent themselves or simply close out and go into something else. So we're going to see a lot of shaking up of that. Um, again, you know, for some maybe optimistic, uh, trying to say, well, look, let's come out of this and rethink everything, you know. Uh, so uh, it, it's a tremendous window of opportunity. 
it may be that some places will seize it better than others. You know, everything from, hey, now we need better, you know, uh, bike lanes or walking places. People need to, you know, be able to enjoy going out more or even a, a sense of community spirit. I think we've seen examples of that in different places where people have suddenly gotten to know their neighbors they've lived next to forever. And now for the first time, maybe start talking to them. But, um, uh, you know, we've got so much uncertainty still ahead. Yeah. I think we're not quite out of it for some time. And, yeah. uh, you know, we, we're going to have to roll with it and see, see how it plays out. And what, what listening to you, what comes to my mind is this, is that we, we already know that we're going to suffer a certain number of casualties. And it's unpredictable how many, only a lot. Mm -hmm. We already know that a lot of businesses are likewise casualties. Okay. So when, when you look at it, of course, we want to renew, we want to reinvent, reimagine our whole society. And the positive point is that at the end of the day, like it or not, we will ha have to do that. Mm -hmm. But in the process, there will be many, many casualties. Sure. Yeah. And people and, aren't really used to that idea. Yeah. No, and, and even those who are facing, you know, you know, people who are dying, it's not a death like in the past. You suddenly, you can't even see the people at the end of their life and you can't have a funeral in a proper way. And so that... I can't help but imagine, you know, for psychologists and mental health professionals, what that is doing to people and, and you know, just the whole, you know, stay at home uh, crisis, uh, what it has done to, you know, to create, you know, again, trauma, again, I don't know what it would be called, but just dealing with the anxiety you know, that this has caused surely has an impact on our lives that, you know, we have yet to figure out what, you know, what that will mean. Uh, so it is remarkable. Again, I'm the eternal optimist, so I want to think that yes, we'll get through this, and, and surely we will. And and, and yet, boy, uh, uh, I, I think we're we're still going to be in for a lot of, as you said, a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, and 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 the continued muddling of again the mixed signals from political leaders. To me, that's a real problem. And yeah. boy, you, you would like to think just get those rascals out. I mean, if people can't just think of themselves, you have to think of the public interest. Get those rascals out. Well, thank you, Carlos. I, I, uh, I must say this doesn't make me feel like I'm <laughs> happier than a few minutes ago, but I feel like uh, we've had a good conversation and I'm look, looking forward to our next one on whatever subject uh, is, is current at the time, probably more around COVID. Yes. But thank you so much, yes. Carlos. And likewise, and raising public awareness as we do here on Think Tech. So thank Absolutely. you, Jay, for, for your, uh, and look forward to our next chat. Aloha. Aloha.